Well, the making pictures those days was pretty much a home cooking proposition. In other words, if you needed a kid to play in the thing, you'd say, well, who's got a kid? And they'd bring one down, you know. And I lived up on Franklin Circle with my family, and they needed a, a kid to play a brat in this, in this picture, doing a lot of slapping and a lot of kicking and a lot of uh, torturing of poor Charlie. And uh, my old man brings me down, and I was a, a, a well-brought-up kid and a gentle child, and I had no, I, I was not a great slapper of people. And so when it came time to start slapping people, uh, I didn't want to do it. I said, I don't want to slap, I don't want to hit Uncle Charlie. And, you know, I was a gentle kid. And poor Charlie uh, couldn't get me to slap him until finally he and Sidney were playing slapping games. And they're saying, Sidney, hit me again. And Sidney would give him a shot. And Charlie said, oh, it's so much fun. And oh, I just love it. And when he's hitting himself. And he finally convinced me that, that, that slapping was a great charge to him, you know. So I think I might have gotten into the swing of it later Hollywood, 1918. Arriving at his own studio as the most successful film director in the business. And times when I was at the studio and he would arrive, Alf Reeves would shout, he's here! And I think that's the only time I ever heard that, in the theater among show people or um, on sets, film sets, or anything. He's here, like the prince has arrived. On this back lot, and on his two stages, Chaplin would produce his greatest work. He now had complete control over the making of his films. He even had his own laboratory. But he was still answerable to his distributors. First National had paid him a million for eight pictures with no time limit. He'd taken two years to make four. With Independence, he had slowed down. The hectic pace of the Mutuals, 12 films in 16 months, had given way to an atmosphere of relaxation. with the company who would stay with Chaplin for years. These shots appear to be genuine glimpses of Chaplin at work. But no, they were staged for a film Chaplin tried to slip into his First National contract. First National rejected it. They were worried, for he was spending month after month on a mysterious film with a child actor named Jackie Coogan, the kid. Slate 1775, the only fragment of the rushes to survive.
Chaplin was using more and more of First National's money, and the film was growing longer and longer. He had a, a, an idea, and he just developed an idea from an idea from an idea. It was strictly a cuff tone, off the cuff. And they're little, little vignettes. They're all hung together by a, a small gossamer that's already taken five, six months. And uh, no story, just little bits of a story. Chaplin was given advice. Invite the first national exhibitors to the studio. They came in a body. I think they were going to lynch him. <laughs> and uh, they were, he knew what was going on. I mean, you know, Chaplin was no dummy. He knew that the pressure was on. And he uh, put me on <coughs> to uh, divert their wrath. And we got him wound up with a, a whole bunch of stuff that, that I did with Chaplin. We had little bits that he had taught me. And that, that uh, uh, I did a dance. I did the shimmy. Stuff from the old act that these fellas had never seen before. much time as you want, Charlie, and uh, he was going to anyway, because nobody could say hurry up to him. This was safe. <laughs> Chaplin introduces another child to the cast, Lita Gray. I became his flirting sweetheart in the heavens sequence of the picture because Charlie had been experimenting with me, putting my hair up on the top of my head. My hair was long then. And he had the wardrobe lady dress me in my mother's clothes, and I photographed quite a bit older. So he said, I think we can use her as the, as the, uh, the, flo the angel. That was in the second half of the picture. The tramp falls asleep on the doorstep after he's looked for the boy, the child that's taken away from him. And he uh, wakes up and thinks that the street is heaven and everybody has wings and it was very pretty. And I come around the corner, sticking a very skinny leg out, I remember, <laughs> in a flirtatious kind of way, after I finished the kid contract. And I was bragging to Myrna about having worked for Charlie, what a marvelous man he was, and so forth and so on. And she was intrigued. She wanted to meet him. So I said, well, we'd go to the studio and watch him work one day which we did. And as soon as Charlie came out to greet us, he said, you're just in time because I've been testing brunettes for, for a part in the, in the Gold Rush, this film that I'm going to make. So he did another film test on me and decided that I would be right for the part. It was 1924. Lita was 15. Now Chaplin led his company on an expedition to Truckee in Northern California. It would be an epic, a story of the Klondike. Chaplin had never done anything like this before. He shipped up everything to make a huge production. For now, he was free of First National's petty restraints. He was one of the united artists. He told Lita he wanted this to be his greatest film. Besides the animals, Chaplin brought virtually his entire crew, together with an Alaskan veteran. Sid Grauman, who owned the, Grauman, the famous Grauman's Chinese Theater here at that time, came down to the train to say goodbye to us, and Charlie held him on the train. He didn't have a toothbrush or a change of clothes or anything, and he went all the way to Truckee with us and stayed the whole trip. 
Outside Truckee, there was nothing. The first task was to build the Gold Rush village at the foot of Summit Mountain. Chaplin surrounds himself with associates, old and new. As an assistant, Eddie Sutherland, who recalls the trip in a 1959 recording. I was Chaplin's assistant, so I said camera and cut. And I made suggestions like everybody else, but don't let anybody tell you they ever directed Chaplin. Chaplin directed himself. Sutherland's first job was to organize the Chilkoot Pass. I had got a ski club from uh, Truckee. We went up and built an exact replica of uh, Chilkoot Pass. We sent down to Sacramento. We bought these 1,100 men from Sacramento, all tramps from the Yolo jungle. They arrived, we had them on the road at 6 o'clock, and we shot Chilkoot Pass all in one day, the entire thing of the guys going over the hill. And Charlie turned to me and said, Eddie, that's the greatest executive feat I've ever seen in my life. 1931, the talkies have... From the moment he announced his plans, he was criticized. People said he was going out of style. He was crazy to ignore the talkies. Above all, they said, his direction was too old-fashioned. Among the actors on the set was a future director. Every director has his own way of working. He was unique. The films that he made were quite successful, the most successful ever anybody made, so you have to say he's a, a, a great picture maker, and directing was part of it. Chaplin's rejection of sound seemed arrogant, but he knew the tramp could never speak. The story of City Lights was simple. The tramp mistaken for a millionaire by a blind flower girl who falls in love with him. First, he had to find the right girl. He chooses a Chicago society girl, 20-year-old Virginia Cheryl. Before I signed my contract with Charlie, I made very clear that I wasn't an actress, that I'd had no training of any kind. And he said, that's exactly what I want. If you had had any training, you would have to unlearn it because I like to work my own way, and it's not the way anyone else works. To see him at work has never been possible, for no film existed, until a remarkable home movie came to light, taken by a close friend. It's the only film in existence of Chaplin directing in his tramp costume. He shows her how to hand a flower. As he stands, he is trying to perfect that simple action. The whole story seems so simple, yet it had to be set up in this one scene. If it failed, so would the film. So Chaplin lavished time on Virginia Cheryl. He was a great inspiration. He gave you so much of the spirit of what he was trying to get out of you. He acted out every part. This was his way of direction. We had no script. And Charlie would simply say, in this scene, I want you to do so and so and so. And then he would show you exactly how he wanted it done. And it sounds ridiculous, but you found yourself feeling that he was you. It's a... How could he be a blind girl? But he was, if, if he was handing you a flower. You, you, you had this feeling that he was that person. The flower stand scene is the first time the flower girl meets the tramp. Chaplin has placed Virginia close to a drinking fountain. But it's the chain that has caught his attention. A watch chain, perhaps? Then he selects a flower. She offers the wrong one. Conveying the blindness was hard enough. Much more difficult was the girl mistaking him for a rich man. What if a rich man buys a flower first? It doesn't help. 
He didn't care how many takes he took. In fact, um, I often thought that if he couldn't think what he was going to do next, he simply went on doing the same shot over again until he thought of it. But uh, he was a perfectionist, and to us it often seemed to be exactly the same, but to him it was not. Chaplin's frustration mounts as the film seems to crumble before him. He loses patience with the way his assistant, Harry Crocker, handles the extras. He tries another approach. Charlie rushes back and spends his last nickel on the other flower. He already has the first one in his lapel. The girl is supposed to think the rich man has come back for her. The cameras turn on this scene day after day. It was boring in that uh, there was so much waiting. One waited, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days, sometimes for months, literally, three or four months. And Charlie wouldn't come to the studio. The report sheets show that after three weeks shooting, Chaplin was taken ill. He had not solved the sequence. No shooting for over a month. But the cast is kept at the studio just in case. Nothing to do. I simply sat in my dressing room and read books, knitted, did needlepoint, and was generally bored. 83 days into the picture. No shooting on 62. April the 1st, Chaplin returns and starts again on the flower stand sequence. Now he makes the tramp more soulful, more romantic. But he still can't crack the problem. He'd take it over and over and over again. And when he'd finally say, it's a take, we'd breathe a sigh of relief, and then he'd say, well, perhaps just one more time. He tries changing the meeting. He's moved the girl further from the fountain. But why does she stop him? It's becoming a nightmare, one that was still vivid three years later when he worked with Alistair Cook. He once told me that Virginia Sherrill couldn't lift a flower up properly. And he said it took hours to say, look, all you do is take a flower and you hold it up like this. That's all. But he said somehow she did this or that, you see. He managed to complete the scene, but he knew something was still missing. He still hadn't solved the problem of the girl mistaking him for a rich man. It would bother him to the very end of production. After 534 days, with no shooting for most of them, he returned to the flower stand sequence. He woke up one morning, he said, and it suddenly occurred to him, a slamming door of the automobile. So, of course, what happens is that he, he goes to the girl, uh, says he'd like a flower, or bunch gives a, everything he has in the world which could well be a dollar or a dime and as she's reaching for her change the rich man walks she hears the rich man walk back across the sidewalk get in the car slam the door and the car takes off and she's about to give the change and she says oh thank you sir and then Chaplin looks at her and realizes he's not going to get anything back and turns round and tiptoes away without his change. Well, it's, it's just like, you know, water running over a pebble. Charlie was a god. You forget. Everyone forgets that in this studio, he was the only person. 
whose opinion mattered in any way. All the pressures were on him. Talkies had taken over completely. He had to fire a leading actor and reshoot all his scenes. And always he had to cope with Virginia's inexperience. He would walk out and he'd put his hands out as though he couldn't see, and then he would run back and be himself. Then he would be the background action. He would say, these people are crossing like this, and you must, and he'd, uh, he did everything. And he was a dervish. City Lights moves into its second year, no end in sight. Visitors to the studio could be a welcome diversion. If there were stars present, he had to be the, uh, the most important star. But Charlie was always acting. He was always on. Winston Churchill poses self-consciously on the City Lights set. And Chaplin seems stuck for an idea to bring the visit to life. Back to work, and Chaplin shoots a test for a new idea. The blind girl's vision of her mysterious admirer. Four thousand three hundred and thirty-seven slates in, he abandons the prince and returns to the simplicity of his story. This scene shows Charlie's farewell. He has given her the money to have her sight restored. He knows he will go to prison and never see her again. The touching relationship of the screen did not exist in real life. I don't think Charlie really liked me very much. I, I don't know why. I liked him. I was very impressed with him. But we had almost no social contact of any kind. I was never invited to his house because he didn't entertain very much. But when he did entertain, I was never invited. Um, I had my own life. I think perhaps I had been married and divorced, and perhaps I was more sophisticated than he saw me. Perhaps he saw me as the blind girl and not as me, and for this reason didn't like me. She had the scene, the last part of the picture, where she realizes it's him, and she feels and gives him the flower, and, well, it's a, I mean, it's a heartbreaking moment. It's a magnificent moment in, in the picture. And she said to him just before they did the take, uh, do you think I might get off a little early today because uh, I have to go to the hairdressers. I'm going to a party tonight. And he went crazy. Charlie fired me in the middle of the film. I was late coming back, probably from lunch, and he was kept waiting, which was not allowed. So he said I was spoiled and I obviously shouldn't be in films, and I was fired. The star of the gold rush was brought in. She was not a, a really an actress. And uh, he simply fought all the way to get the, her to do the scenes and never felt that she, he was getting them. But when it came to the final scene, the dramatic scene, where she realizes that after she has her sight that he was the one who was her benefactor, and she feels his hand and realizes this is the chap that did all these things for her. He did reshoot that scene with me. He played the part right with me off camera, but he was the little tramp and he was the, uh, the one that I, 
played right with. So the feeling was right there between us because it, he didn't just direct it, he played it with me. So I saw him and he was with me. And there was a complete report between us. And he loved it. And he said, I'm going to redo all of City Lights with you just the way I did the Gold Rush. I'm going to redo the whole thing with you. But even Chaplin realized this was not the Gold Rush. Times had changed, and he had shot far too much film. Marion Davis knew he'd never wasted. A friend of both, she told Virginia, now you can name your own terms. So I said to Charlie, uh, I can't come back and work, you know, because I no longer have a contract with you. And he said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, I signed it before I was of age. He said, that's nonsense, absolute nonsense. So I said, no, it isn't. I was 21 last week. And ask your lawyer if it's not so. And he hung up. He called back later and said, I think you'd better come down and we'll talk about it. So Marion said, now you've got him. And I went back and I got double the amount. So I had the large sum of $150 a week from then on to the rest of the film. It was three years since the last Chaplin film. Silent films were now a curiosity. Yet, at the opening, a crowd of 25,000 caused a near riot. Chaplin's future rested on this film, for which he'd even written the music. He was extremely nervous. All the way down, he kept saying, I don't care if, if it's a failure or a success. And I, what is fame? Well, I don't care a bit about uh, fame or being popular or accepted. And he kept raving on about uh, convincing himself that he just didn't care about how the evening went. It wasn't going to affect him one way or the other. And then we get to the uh, theater. And at the end of the picture, they all stand in acclamation, just applauding him until they, it reverberated with the noise, whistling and everything. And then he admitted like a little baby. I do love the public. I've got to have a, uh, a claim. I've got to be accepted by people. And he was himself. He admitted that he needed the applause of the world. He lived on it. He loved it. 